Brad, uh, the, some of the significant uh, features of his uh, illustrious career is that he's not only one of the founders of CADRE um, and one of the uh, main officers of CADRE, but he was also the first percussion caption chairman of DCA. And um, he's taught the, he taught the uh, uh, Canada's marching ambassadors in Toronto for many years, and um, that was the guy that, that made such a magnificent drum line up there. So yes. without any further ado, we introduce to you Fred Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, once I'd like to thank the association for asking me back. This is the second time I made at least part of this presentation. Uh, this presentation goes back to 1333. It's the first use of British Army service drums in the Battle of Helen Hill in 1333. And it goes back to that because there are references that we can make to that. Uh, as we come forward, we're going to talk about several things. The copy is yours to take home. Well, you only have 30, 35 minutes, so we're going to cover the highlights. And when we cover the highlights, you can go home and get more detail. Um, here, we're going to study drum scores starting in 1780, and we're going to go right up into the late 1930s. Uh, it's very important that we look at these, and before I start, I want to make sure everybody in the room understands something. One, you have to transport your mind back to the 1700s. Don't think of it in terms of 2014, or you'll be totally screwed up by the end. You have to go back to that era of communicative drumming which was so important to both American and British armies. Keep that in mind. The drum meetings they played, things like this, were all done to do one thing, send a message to some soldiers as quickly as possible and as simple as possible so it could be understood, no questions asked. We're going to talk in here about the propensity of rudimental drummers to change other people's scores. When we get to that point, you'll find it interesting because we make reference to a royal warrant in England issued around 1610 uh, to simply tell all <coughs> drummers in the British Empire of the day, stop screwing around with the parts. And it was very important, and the reference they make is the old English march that was written in the early 1600s. And the fear was that the way the drummers were abusing it, by the time they had finished, no one was recognizing what the English march was and what it was all about. So we're going to cover that. This will give you an idea of the notational changes and a bit of history of our rudimental art form and how the notation has progressed through the years. Uh, you'll find that interesting. I'll take you back to the pow, 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 pow era uh, in play in Great Britain. Uh, we've also here examined uh, a couple of French publications. Uh, as you may know, the French and Swiss and Prussian uh, rebellions are distinctly different than the British and American. And once again, the British and the American rebellion is distinctly different, and we'll cover that. Uh, so we're going to start here with the mother and the three camps. And if you'd like to look at the score, you'll see it. It's the young drummer's assistant. And if you would take a look at it, it's very important. Because the one thing that I want to make sure you understand, we transport our minds back but you have to put your mindset in the frame of a historian. Uh, and it's not easy. If you take a look at that score alone, the first thing you'll notice is it's written entirely in quarter notes and in eighth notes. There are no bar lines. You have to imply 
a bar line before you can analyze it properly. I'm going to get through this, but in your piece, I've set out the rationale that I, just me, that's what I use to analyze that score, and you can transport that analysis to several other scores that are in there. Uh, what you discover at the end, if you go through that rationale, is that even this does not fit. You cannot take quarter notes and eight notes and produce them down to 30 second note forms to play the roles in meter. If you do, you'll end up with 16th notes in front of the five stroke rolls, and you'll end up with one bar at the end of the 11 with a value of three eight notes and you need four. So it has to be. So if you're looking at this score when you go home, just take the eight notes and put them as 16th notes and you'll be just fine, okay? So that's the first score that we've looked at. That's 1,780. It comes out of London, England. It's a very historical score because most historians refer back to this or Sam Potter or to Ashworth. And the, so we're going to cover those. Uh, I'm asking the, the drummers here, uh, Paul Mosley and David McLaren, um, I want them to play this score. What we're going to do is we're going to play it at 76 counts to the minute in simple duple time. Or common time is the line 2444. Nobody plays 44 properly anymore anyway, so it's uh, I want you to get an idea. Everybody thinks in terms of velocity when it comes to the mother and three cats. Off it goes. Some people play it in 12-8, and some of us go to sleep while we play it in 12-8 time. But what you have to recognize in those days, the common step, if you go back to that arrow, was 75 or 76 beats per minute with the 38, 30 inch British pace, if you so much in a minute, so much in an hour with the 15 minute rest and you're on a root march. So I'm asking them to play this, and if you want a tap or you got a drum pad, please join me. But it's important that you understand that historically, the three camps was not played at 120 beats to the minute. Even Potter will refer to, for ceremonial occasions, the passage would be 108 counts to the minute. Now that's very important to keep in mind because in my generation and some other generations that are here, we always had a bad habit of not understanding what the pace of the common step was back in the 1700s. So I'm going to ask them to play it at about 76 counts to the minute. Do you guys want to have some fun? Yeah. yeah. Walk in the room tonight, get out a drum pad and play it both to the right and the left hand. 76 counts the minute, and you'll, where, John moved in here? John, a great presentation today, and John mentioned something. Break it down and play it slow and learn it to play it properly before you may want to speed it up. Now this one, if you have never done it, get your metronomes out, as John said, not forever, but for at least part of the time, and try to play it. And this is what it would sound like, and this is what it sound like in Great Britain and the United States of America back in this period of time. Ashford score in there. 
that you may wish to look at. And my favorite book, Samuel Potter, I call him Sam Sam the Three Camps Man. And uh, his book is very, very underestimated by many historians. It's a wonderful book, so is the Ashworth book. But you've got to set this picture. Uh, these publications are from around 1812. You have two British army drummers. One immigrates to the United States, eventually with the United States Marine Band in Washington City. The other drummer stays and becomes, who had joined the Full Speed Arms as a drummer boy at the age of 14. He was then promoted to drum sergeant and then become the drum major of the whatever regiment of foot, which we all know as the Full Speed Guards. Now, when they played that version, we're not going to deal with three versions. And we're starting this thing with a lot of controversy. And at the end, we're going to end up with more controversy. So keep that in mind. But what they play is in simple time, and they play the 10 or the 11 in meter. They started that 1 16th note or 2 32nd notes before the downbeat. If you look at these scores, you then have to make an assumption because all of these scores up to 1937, so 1780 to 1937, every score we examine shows the 10s and the 11s played on the downbeat. So you have to be careful as a historian not to make an assumption. And that's a bad assumption to make. That no, I'm going to convert this to modern notation. That means the 11s and the 10s have to be played in meter. That means two 30-second notes before the downbeat. But if you go back to 76 comes in the minute, or for ceremonial occasions with Sam Sam, the three camps fan, up to 108, which was the quick step of the day, there's no reason why you have to play the roles starting before the downbeat. You can play them on the downbeat. However, you'll see in modern notation, how do you write it? So we writers just been tough with roll, okay? So when they play that, you are dealing five stroke rolls and one for the tens and the elevens, okay? Just keep that in mind. So if you're going through the rationale trying to figure out what some of these scores mean, you'll see. The other thing, as we go on now, they set the stage you have Somebody in London, England, you've got somebody in Washington City, and you've got the young drummers assistants preceding all of that. We now enter into another era. And the era is in the United States, generally they follow up right to around the late 1800s. Now, all the American drummers in the room. My first trip to the United States was 1948, come to New York City for the Lions International Trade. I talked to American drummers then, and I spent a lot of time with a lot of you wonderful people here in the United States. How many people in this room have ever heard an American drummer play the Ashford version of the Three Camps? How many? I thought the whole room would stand up. This revered publication. And people have not followed them for some reason, and yet the American authors for the next almost 100 years follow that pattern. He uses a roll mix of seven stroke, he fills seven stroke rolls, sevens on the beat and things like that. But the scores are there for you to look at, okay? So now we're entering up into the 1800s, a very, very important period in all of our lives. Uh, a couple of us in the room here went to the war in 1812, and uh, it goes on and on. So uh, anyway, keep in mind that you have in the United States a country who has a lot of new authors, and they are very innovative. And I've analyzed these scores to depth, and they are innovative. They've done some wonderful things, except they forgot about the young drummer's assistant. That's okay. Then let's not worry about that. They even later in life invent something in compound time, without a respect for the history. But we go through this whole period of this, and if you look at the American uh, 
uh, Ravelli, it becomes not so much uh, a few drum beatings, it really become a fife and drum concert. If you look at them playing the Hessians and Hutch and all these things in conjunction with the modern and the three taps, it becomes sort of a concert. In Great Britain, no, they played the three tap taps that I've got in there for you, and then they would play the mother of the three taps followed by the slow scotch. Um, whereas the Americans have turned it into somewhat of a beautiful rudimental concert. So we move on from there. What you will notice in notation, and this is important to note, we've got to get up to rum reel of hope, believe it or not, before we see the first musical notes implied. A lot of them are like uh, the original scores, but it's not till a number of years later you actually see rudimental drum notation introduced. Uh, and that's important, but when you read it at home. The other thing that you'll notice that's in here, if you go to page 11, uh, if you look at page 11, some of the traditional American scores were written in code, a numeric code. And that, you can see uh, page 10, page 11, how, and some of these great authors, what they did is they written in numeric code. <coughs> David McLaren and I have just returned from Basel, Switzerland. And I was amazed we were in one of the principal drum uh, stores there, and I found a book. It's about that thick. And the whole book is written in the Witzner Code. And they're still using it today in Switzerland, in Basel, with some of the drum plates. Anyway, nowadays, if, if we just don't pay attention to that. But it's interesting to note that those wonderful drummers over there, some of them are being, still being taught with the Witzner Code. Have you got the book there? There. Thank you, Peter. This guy saves me. You. It covers, there's the book. It covers Berger, okay, and all of these, and it's all, it's all Berger with his regular notation, and they get into the code system here. And that's the code system from the 1900s in there. And it's a, a great, but I was surprised to see it there. And uh, anyway, we, Dave and I were out for a beer, and we're out with the guy who runs a very, well-known drum fleet over there, and I said to him, Danny, I'd like to take back to Canada with me one of, you know, that's typical of what you're playing. He pulls up the thing that has to be the Whistler code. He said, this is how we learn. This is how we play. Okay, we're going to go on. Um, next thing is, I want you to take a look at that code and then start to go on. Uh, you'll see descriptions of something called the points of war. And you can spell it W-A-R or English W-A-R-R-E. -E. When you see it in there, it's not a spelling error. That's the way it was done, okay? One of the things that I have discovered, I think, in the research, in many publications, they say the three camps or the points of war. And when you look at the analysis, I give you about eight authors in there each of which have a different description of what the points of war is or was or whatever. And it's important that you look at that because one describes it as a drum beating, an imitation of a battle. Uh, others describe it as, no, it's the first part of the three camps is the points of war. And it turns out that may not be true. Uh, the points of war or the three camps, the first part, of the three camps is, in fact, in most cases, part of the points of war. But it is not necessarily the whole points of war, and that description may help us maybe change our thinking. Yes, George? Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, yeah. There, yeah the, the description out of uh, England is in here, George, and it describes that and the and what you're referring to, the names of, of, of those beatings. Are the, by the way, this gentleman is a, an incredible historian, uh, and I bent his ear for I don't many, know how many hours on the telephone, and George was very, very patient with me. I got to tell you a little story about this wonderful man. We discovered in the phone that we both had marched in the city of Ottawa for the Queen's celebration for coronation, and we marched and were billeted in the same barracks in 1957. And uh, we, since then, have sort of looked at it and said, well, how do you like that? <laughs> a bit of history. But George has been very, very helpful. And uh, whenever I'm stuck or in a corner and I need a little advice, it's George Carroll, the one that I pulled down here. Uh, okay, we'll go on now. As we go through this era, we've got all kinds of different notations, and you'll see that in there. Uh, you've got the codes that are not necessary, the Witzner code. The American authors invented their own code. So there you go. That's all in there. And then as we march through this, we have to look because there's a turning point that starts to happen, and that is with Gardner Scrooge. Um, when you get to Scrooge, you'll be surprised what you see, because we have the American authors traditionally <coughs> following, following uh, Ashworth. All of a sudden, Scrooge comes out, and he reverts to the Potter Romans. And I was surprised to discover that, but it's a fact. That, that's it. The Potter roll mix is fives, tens, and elevens. Scrooge is five, tens, and elevens. But he introduces a new ending. Da -dum -da -dum, and we're all familiar with that. But that damn ending mm -hmm. wasn't invented until 1862 or something like that. So all the scores to this point end, bump, rump, rump, that's it for the ending of the three camps. So we get that. Now, what I'm going to do is ask them to play another version. Okay? And we're going to play this version and listen to the tens in the elevens. These will be played as quintuplet rolls starting on the downbeat. Okay? The fives are a different roll velocity. They're the roll velocity in simple time. Okay? So if you do this, you've got to deal with two distinct roll velocity patterns.
Okay? The score is there. It was published by the Ludwig Drum Company. Um, if you look at the notation, you may wish to question if it, in fact, should have been written in simple time. There's, you'll see the use, and I, on the narrative, it'll explain to you, uh, there is a numeric five under a roll, but it's written as a seven-stroke roll. There is a numeric 11 underneath the roll that is written as a 13-stroke roll. So when you're analyzing this, you have to say, what do they mean? There are the proper number of notes in the bar. If you do it mathematically, you'll come up with the right number of notes. The problem is, how do you interpret a numeric five that's written as a seven-stroke roll with a dot? So you start to suffer from analysis paralysis. That's what you do. And you have to begin to make assumptions. My assumption is, one, that this probably, and I underline probably, may have been written in 12A time and we may have understood it. The other thing is, the great impact associated with this was the record on which Frank Arsenal plays the three tenths. And he's got it pumped up. I can tell you, he's playing it up around 138 pounds to the minute. But I can't, I played it 100 times. I don't know if that's what Frank was playing. I just don't know. It's, it's too tight the way it's notated. But keep in mind the importance of that record. In North America, or all around the world, there are thousands of drummers who've never seen the score, or a score of the three tenths. But they learned it off that record. They learned it by rope, or their buddy and the drum line taught it to them, or so forth. And that was the first audio we had a chance to listen to, an incredible record. We still, all the time, still listen to it. We still use it as a reference point. But that was the breaker right there. And keep in mind, because the biggest problem with this thing is tempo. And in this piece, you've got tempos ranging from around 60 pounds to the minute up to 144 pounds to the minute. George, the uh, CD that I got from you, do you remember how fat you guys are pumping it up? They play the Bruce and Nevis version, which has nine stroke rolls, but that tempo was pretty brisk you guys were playing on. Well, they're live and learn. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it, it's very fast. Okay. Now let's move on, and we're going to skip some things. But uh, read Moeller's description when you get home about slurring the rules in the camp duty. That's very important that you do that. And when you go home and study this, don't get mad at me. I read notes. I don't study authors. I just read notes, and up to 1937, there's not one score in here that was written correctly. As unfortunately, as the way they wrote it by convention, they all understood it, and it treated us just fine. So keep that in mind, just to... There's, a, there's another factor that's the operational here, and that is if you read the, the regulations for how these things were to be employed in the yep. camp, you were marching in front of the regimental tent line. Yes. You were on what they call the Grand Parade. Yeah. You, you, you were calling in by your company first sergeant at the tent line, and then you marched over to the yeah. Grand Parade. Yeah. And then when you played any of the four main calls of the day, the Reveille, the Retreat, the Tattoo, and the, the General. Yeah. Uh, then you had to march down in front of each of the tent line at yeah. right angle to the, to the uh, way the tents were set up. And so you had to march when you were playing these feet. Yeah. The slower you played, readily, the harder it was to mark. Absolutely. Uh, George mentioned, and that's covered in here, George. Yes. I put it in that you had told me that they had occasion to march. Another thing, uh, British infantry regulations, code number so-so and so-so, at the end, they march, they play the points of war, and at the end, the drummers turn and face, and they play the mother and the three cats 
as loud and as fast as possible. That's British Army regulations, but that's from a uh, later in life, not back in 1790. Okay, so here we go. We're going to go up to Warren Benson. Is there anybody in here that played with us? Out the there is one from the here from the uh, Heritage uh, concert that we did in Columbus, Ohio a few years ago. Uh, okay, the version, if you go up to this back in here, is the version that we had to play. We went to a Heritage concert and we had to play the mother and the three camps in 12 8 times. I don't know what that has to do with Heritage, but. Uh, that's what it was, but the Benson score is in there, and it's very important that you look at that score because it's the first full score we can find that talks about playing it in 12 8 time. They downloaded the fight part, put it in 12 8 time. Uh, they took out of the molar or screw book the simple time version and they converted it to 12 8 time and so forth, and the metronome marking is 76 to 140 some odd pounds to the You figure that one out. But it's important because we played that version here yesterday. And so, so you had that. So now we're working up, we've got to get to the end here. Uh, we've gone from the 1700s and we're up into the 1980s. And uh, we now, see a propensity of many drummers uh, to play the mother of the three camps in 12-8 time, which historically doesn't exist. Either by regulation that the American government has approved certain of these drum books that you're going to study, but they've never looked at anything in 12-8 time. So we have that dilemma we have to deal with. But I'm going to conclude that get the guys to play a couple more things. Um, the one thing that I'm asking you to really think about is this. You can play the three camps anywhere from 76 to 144 times per minute. At 144, you've got to keep in mind, that's about the equivalent of 120 times per minute in simple dual time. The roll velocities are distinctly different. You're playing slower in 12-8 time. You're playing six notes in the space of eight. So if you take 120 divided by this and that, it's not hard to get up to 140 some odd counts in a minute. You've got that. You've got the difficulty of dealing with, do I play the rolls in meter, or do I play them, convert them to quintuplets and play them on the downbeat? And You've got these things that you're facing, but the message that I'd like to deliver before the fellows are playing is this. Wherever you go in the world, anywhere, you can come up to the land of the ice and the snow with me. I can come to the United States of America. You can go to Great Britain. I've talked to Australian drummers who played this drum meeting all over the world and you're going to be encumbered with this. You're going to walk in the room, and there's some guy in the room who plays his or her version of the three taps, which may not be the same as your version. So here's what I would suggest you do. You simply say to him, okay, what's the time signature? What's the tempo? Are you playing the roles in meter? or not, then you play with it. And you go home, and you've had another wonderful drumming experience. You've learned something. You've learned that there's more than one way they made it to play this beat. But historically, there was only one way. So I'm going to ask them to play the 12-8 version, which is Warren Benson's version, and that comes out of Ithaca College in the States. We're going to ask for questions, George, if you don't mind. So that I'll let the guys do this one. Okay? Uh, okay. This is the, I don't know what tempo they're going to play, that, but this is what we played yesterday, the 12 8 version.
blade. Okay? And we're going to crank it up into 120 some odd beats to the minute in simple duple time with the rolls plate and meter.